All right, some of you are still here. That's great. You've made it. You've almost made it. One session to go. You're three quarters of the way through. But uh, no, it's looking beautiful outside. I'd love to be out there too. All right, this final session here, Noah's Flood, Key to Understanding the Earth's History. Now that title might seem a little, might, might cause you to question a little bit, like, really? Noah's Flood is the key to understanding the Earth's history? And I hope when we're finished in a couple hours here, and you'll see, <laughs> no, when we're finished in about an hour, you'll see how that statement really does make sense. Noah's flood really is the key to understanding the history of the earth, the ancient history anyways, of the earth. So just to get us pointed in the right direction, let's think of this question. Again, simple question. What would a global flood do? We read the Bible, we read about the flood account there in Genesis 6, 7, 8, and if the flood happened the way the Bible describes, what would it actually do? If you've ever thought about that, now, now's your chance. We're going to think about that. What would a flood do? Well, firstly, there would be erosion and deposition on a global scale. Global flood, even, even little floods, local floods, lots of erosion. They rip out bridges, rip out homes, rip out highways and roads, and, and they deposit that somewhere else. There'd be erosion and deposition in a global flood on a global scale. So that would, our, that would impact our understanding of the Earth's geologic features surface features around the earth. It would also bury plants and animals on a global scale, again. So that's going to impact our understanding of the earth's fossils, paleontology. And number three, it would restart human history. The whole human population bottlenecked down to eight people and rebooted in a sense. So it would impact our understanding of ancient history, the ancient nations, when they came to be, how they came to be, where they came to be, languages and so on associated with Babel. And it's going to impact all of those things. Those are the three major areas we're going to look at in this next hour here. Or if we, if we frame this negatively, if we, if we, what, what happens if you deny a global flood? Denying a global flood will lead to a misinterpretation of data in geology, paleontology, and ancient history. And we'll see that as well. So, but before we get into these three, let's just do a quick biblical survey of like 10 or so biblical evidences for a global flood, not a local flood. Because the, the local flood theory is very popular in the church. Well, should I say very? It's, it's popular in the church. This notion that uh, the flood only happened uh, over in ancient Mesopotamia, uh, but, it, but it didn't cover the whole earth and so on. Let's look at 10 biblical evidences for a global flood. Number one, the need for the ark. Just the need for the ark is an evidence for a global flood. Why not just move, right? A few chapters later, God tells Abraham to pick up and move. It's quite some distance, it turns out. He could have told the same thing to Noah if the flood was a local flood. But there was nowhere to move to because it was a global flood. Noah had to build an ark. The size of the ark is another evidence for a global flood. The, the, the ark was huge. Not this little bathtub shaped ark. And we've looked at pictures of the ark already besides some things that we're kind of familiar with. A very large airplane. It had a huge capacity. It had a very stable design. Naval engineers have discovered that it could list nearly 60 degrees and not capsize, right? I hate to, find, hate, to, hate to think what's going on with all the animals inside. If it lists 60 degrees, it all needs seat belts or something. But uh, very stable design. So the size of the ark itself is an evidence for a global flood. The need for animals to be on that large ark, that's an evidence for a global flood. Because if it was just a local flood, okay, if some animals in a particular area get wiped out, that's sad. But after the flood goes away, the other animals go in and repopulate. It's not a big deal. But Noah had to take animals because it was a global flood. All the land animals were wiped out. That's an evidence that the flood was global. And that leads to the question very naturally, could all the animals fit on the ark? So let's do that as a little rabbit trail here. The Bible tells us that one of every land-dwelling, one pair of every land-dwelling, air-breathing animals and the birds were brought to Noah. Noah didn't have to go on worldwide safari to bring these in. Now that, the description there, just gleaning the meaning from the Hebrew, that probably would not have included insects. 
Insects don't breathe through, it says breathe through nostrils even. Insects have a different way of breathing. But insects could have survived outside the ark on floating bits of logs and trees and twigs and seeds and whatever else is ripped up and floating. Um, and this is where, like people in Winnipeg, they often think, okay, well, why did Noah have to take mosquitoes? Like, they got mosquitoes the size of helicopters in Winnipeg there. And, and they're like, just leave, the, leave those guys behind. But, and and they, they, they probably could have survived outside the, outside the ark anyways. So seven pairs of clean animals, one pair of every seven pairs of the clean animals. So let's work to a total number of animals and then work out the average size and the floor space and food requirements and the size of the ark and so on. That's where we're going here. So how many animals in total would Noah have had to take to get all the millions of species we have today. The Bible talks about kinds, not species. You know what? You end up with about 16,000 animals, 8,000 pairs. And that's probably on the high end to get the millions of species we have today. Again, only two dogs, not wolves and dingoes and coyotes and chihuahuas and Great Danes and German shepherds, just two dogs. And so you can get all the varieties we have today with about 8,000 pairs. So 16,000 animals, probably less, but let's just go with worst case scenario. Let's say it's as high as 16,000. What's the average size? It used to be thought years ago the average size was something like a German shepherd dog or a sheep, something like that. Newer calculations suggest that may be way too large. The average size might be as, as small as a rat. Let's just go with worst case scenario. Let's go with those older calculations and suggest 16,000 sheep size animals. How much floor space on the ark would 16,000 sheep size animals take up? The total floor space is about one third. The Bible tells us that the ark was to be built with three decks, lower, middle, and upper deck. Maybe animals were on the middle deck. You keep your food supply on the upper deck and, and you have doors in the floor, shovel the food down to the animals and so on or have automatic feeding systems where, where they eat a bit and more falls down and uh, Noah could have built things like that. Uh, dinosaurs, what about dinosaurs? We talked about that in our dinosaur thing. Well, dinosaurs are land-dwelling, air-breathing animals and so if we're thinking biblically, God would have brought those to Noah. Um, God likely brought young dinosaurs, we talked about that already. So uh, yeah, not a, not a problem with floor space. In fact, the ark had room for thousands of people. I mentioned this already. Noah preached for over 100 years, the Bible says, that judgment was coming. There was room on the ark for thousands of people. If, if, the, the, main, if the, the, the middle deck or the main deck was filled with animals and the upper deck was filled with food and maybe bedrooms or places where, where Noah and, his, and, and, and the eight on the ark there could, could live and have some, have some comfort, the bottom deck could lots of room left over for Swimming pool, badminton court, go-kart track. <laughs> there was room for thousands of people and only eight people heeded the warning. Now, what, what, how, so how do we get from the 8,000 pairs that got off the ark to the millions of species we have today? We talked about this a little bit, I guess touched on it in the previous session. Imagine cats. We talked about dogs, we talked about cats here. You've got the saber-toothed cats and the main cat kind, but maybe, maybe uh, uh, those created at the time of creation. And then God brings, they diversify a little bit before the flood. And then God brings representatives of those to Noah to take with them on board the ark. And through hybridization experiments with cats and so on, it's looking more and more likely that all the cats we have today, both the big cats and the little cats that we'd have in our, in our homes, came from a single pair that got off the ark. We used to think, well, is it, is it you know, a pair for the large cats and a pair for the, 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 the small cats and so on? It's looking more and more likely that all the cats, lions, tigers, jaguars, uh, cheetahs seem to be their own, their own branch and so on, but even those and the domestic cats we have in our homes came from an original cat kind, two of them that got off the ark. The Smilodons, the saber-toothed cats, they've gone extinct since that time. We don't have them anymore but that's how you can get the great variety that we see today from those that were on the ark so yes animals needed to be on the ark number four the need for birds to be on the ark that is evidence for a global flood isn't it <laughs> why on earth take birds if it's a local flood that makes no sense and yet 
God brought birds to Noah. Noah was to take birds on board the ark. Number five, the judgment was universal. If we look at the, the terminology there in, in the flood chapters and elsewhere, for example, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I've created from the face of the land, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Noah is singled out, but everybody else is gonna be under judgment. It's, it, there's this universal type of language. Again, global flood. Number six, the waters were above the mountains. The Bible tells us the waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them 15 cubits deep. A cubit is the distance, I already said this, between the tip of your hand and your elbow, about 18 inches, so that puts it more than 20 feet above the highest mountains. How can it not be a global flood if you're covering the top of the mountains? We, we, did, a, we did a Photoshop image of... Okay, if you, wanna, if you wanna say it was a local flood, uh, what would a mountain covering local flood look like? And this is what we came up with. There's, how does that make sense, right? If, if the tops of the mountains were covered, that means everything else was covered as well. Number seven, the duration of the flood. The flood began in the 600th year, the second month, the 17th day of Noah's life, and it ended in the 601st year the, tw the second month and the 27th day of Noah's life. So the, the flood was a year and 10 days. What well, sort of a local flood lasts a year and 10 days? That's some local flood, right? There's another, just a does it prove the flood was global? No, it's another little evidence that gives support for a global flood. Number eight, did God break his promise? You remember the covenant that God made uh, with Noah the, the rainbow now is going to get a, a, there was probably rainbows before the flood because there was probably rain before the flood. That might be new news to some of you. But God gave it special meaning after the flood saying, this is now a covenant. I'm never going to destroy the earth in this manner again. God has done that with, for example, at the time of the Passover, when Passover became the Last Supper and became communion, he gave special meaning to bread and wine. Bread and wine existed before before communion started, but he gave them special significance at that point, similar to what he did with the rainbow. Um, has God broken his promise? Because if Noah's flood was a local flood, God would have broken his promise. There are thousands of local floods. There's, there's local flooding in many areas every year. But no, God hasn't broken his promise. Noah's flood was global, and there hasn't been another global flood. We, we would have noticed, I'm sure. <laughs> The Hebrew terminology, you can go into the Hebrew in the flood chapters there. For example, the earth is eretz in Hebrew. It's used 46 times in the flood account in those chapters there. Uh, here's one example of that. God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh for the eretz is filled with violence through them. Now look at this next sentence. Behold, I will destroy them, the wicked people, with the earth. God actually tells Noah he's going to destroy the earth. Yes, the focus of the judgment is on the wickedness of the people, but he says right here, behold, I will destroy them with the earth. God actually tells us in his word, I'm going to destroy the earth. Now, not, not destroy has different ranges, right? Not completely obliterate. This is still the same earth that Noah was walking on before the flood and Adam and Eve and so on. So, but certainly the surface of the, feet, the, surface of the earth was destroyed, completely destroyed. Here's another, we can look at the Hebrew here, the English is plain enough. For example, we looked at this verse already, the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that, look at the terminology, all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. The terminology there seems to certainly imply a global flood, right? And the last one, the New Testament speaks of the flood as global as well. Luke writes that the flood came and destroyed them all. Not just people in a certain region, but the whole earth. God did not spare the ancient world. That's where the world, the, the word world there is cosmos in Greek, where we get our English word cosmos from. But preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others, eight people, that's all, Noah and seven others, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. So there's, there's 10 sort of rapid fire evidences for a global flood. So what would we expect to find? Let's get back to our three main subjects here. In geology, if 
the flood unfolded the way we read in our Bibles, we would expect to find sedimentary rock, that's rock that was laid down by moving water, that shows evidence of rapid deposition. Right? Basic stuff. If the Bible's right, that's what we would expect to find. We believe the Bible is right. We'd also expect in geology, large-scale geologic features. Let's say continent-wide features. A global flood is going to produce large-scale features. So we should see the scientists who go out and study these these subjects, geology and so on, they should be reporting on this. We should see that in the scientific literature. In paleontology, we'd expect evidence for both rapid and recent burial. If the floodwaters came up quickly and rapidly buried plants and animals, we should expect to find that in the fossil record. We'd also expect a general pattern to the fossil record with exceptions. The flood is going to bury things in a particular sequence, but it was a catastrophic event, so there should be a general pattern, but we'll expect things that to be mixed up quite often. General pattern with exceptions. Our third topic, ancient history. We'd expect to find evidence that human population in ancient nations began about 44, 4,500 years ago, something like that. So that's, that's our roadmap for the rest of our time here this afternoon, and, or for this session. Then we'll have a Q&A time uh, to, to wind down the clock here. So if you have your questions, get them ready for later. Let's back up and take these one at a time now. In geology, we'd expect to find sedimentary rock showing evidence of rapid deposition. So now what we'll do in each one of these cases, we'll turn to the scientists. What are you finding out there? What are you seeing? Are you seeing sedimentary rock showing evidence of rapid deposition? Well, we can go, for example, to Grand Canyon. And this is not a scientist. I actually took these pictures when I was rafting through the canyon. But these are these were shot on slide film back in the 90s. And I stitched these two pictures together here. But um, we took a side hike into the one, one of the side canyons there. There's a person's head right down here. I just cut them off the bottom of the frame. But um, you notice there, there's some layers and they're, they're quite bent. And then the layers on the right hand side here go almost vertical. So what's the explanation for that? The explanation is that the entire, all those layers were laid down quickly. So they were all laid down quickly and then some kind of uplift happened over here that pushed those layers, as you can see, nearly, nearly vertical. And at the junction between the horizontal and the vertical layers, the layers are bent. It's it's very difficult to bend solid rock. You you, you can do it, but then if you look under a microscope, you can see the crystal structure has all fractures in it and so on. But the, the best explanation for this here is that it was all laid down quickly, and then while it was still plastic, while it was still soft, it hadn't fully lithified, it hadn't fully turned to solid rock, that uplift happened over here. And then it was still muddy, you can think of it as mud, at that junction there, and so the mud layers bent. If it would have been laid down the way we're commonly told, slowly a millimeter per year or even less, that rock would have have been fully lithified, would have been hard. And so we would expect breaks and cracking at that location, not the bending, right? And yet we see bending there. So, right, right. If you do the calculations, actually, one of our other guys did them. I I don't have them memorized, but he calculated, okay, what's the average thickness of all the sedimentary rock? And it's all been labeled as, oh, you didn't hear the question from the back, but the the, the layers, you wouldn't even see layers is is what was mentioned up here. And uh, the the average deposition, if you take, okay, well, they've, they've labeled it all as this many millions of years, from the oldest layers to the youngest layers, and if you take the average thickness around the world of all the sedimentary rock from bottom to top, that's supposedly all these years old, and then you divide it by the amount of time that they say it is, the deposition rates, I, I forget what it was, but like 1 40th of a millimeter per year. So yeah, you're not going to see any layers. There, there's not going to be anything there. there. There are so many things. Little, little, that, that's maybe a little thing like that, but there's another little thing that just doesn't line up with the millions of years scenario. And there's so many other things that we could point to. But in any case, here's an example of rapidly deposited sedimentary rock. We could look at other examples. This is out in the Bay of Fundy. There's a tree-like fossil going through multiple layers of rock. Right? Obviously, it was buried quickly because if it, if it, again, slow burial, well, the top of the tree would have rotted before it was buried, right? 
and yet the whole thing's, the whole thing's preserved. Here's a vertical fossil tree with its base in a coal seam in ten, down in Tennessee. What's going on there? Trees don't grow in coal, and it must have been rapidly buried. So the plant material, maybe peat, washed in there. It's since coalified, and coalified most of the trunk, and it's, it was rapidly brought into place there. Again, those are the kinds of things we would expect in a global flood, rapid deposition. There are some examples. We could point to many more, but uh, for sake of time, let's move on. What else would we expect in geology? Large-scale features. Again, let's say continent-wide features. Let's go back to Grand Canyon. That's another, uh, there's some great examples here of large-scale features. You see the, here, here's the canyon over here on the right side, and the layers exposed in the canyon, they extend over a huge area in the American Southwest, and it's not just in, on this continent. Some of those layers can be traced to England. That is a large-scale geologic feature. What kind of a river delta produces something that big? That's huge. And so, so there's been massive deposition over a huge area. And in the Grand Canyon area, there's been massive erosion. So massive deposition and massive erosion. If you follow the strata from the rim of the canyon further north, further north you get to Bry uh, the Bryce Canyon, Zion Canyon, beautiful places there in the, in the American uh, Southwest. There's thousands of feet of additional layers of rock further to the north. And some of those were preserved over the Grand Canyon area. How much? Nobody's actually sure. But were, were all of those layers at one point, did they extend over the Grand Canyon area and have been eroded? There's a butte called Red Butte near the rim of the canyon that preserves about 3,000 feet, three kilometers of those sediments that they exist down here. Most of them have been wiped out, have been eroded away from on top of Grand Canyon. But Red Butte preserves some of those same layers that are found further north. So there's evidence for both massive deposition on a huge scale and massive erosion. Those are the kinds of features exactly that we would expect when we read about the global flood and what it would, thinking about what it would do geologically. So what are some other large-scale features? Well, how about the fit of the continents? And the idea that there was one continent originally. These drawings were by Antonio uh, Snyder. He was the first person, to, he was a, a French scientist, first person to publish scientifically on the breakup of the original supercontinent. Now he, that was in 1859, and Alfred Wegener is the one who usually gets the credit because Wegener applied millions of years to it. And, and oftentimes, if you go on Wikipedia and there's, you know, the, the origin of plate tectonics, they'll, they'll, they'll mention They'll mention Antonio Snyder in a little, a little footnote, but he was, he was the first, but it, it became popular when, when uh, uh, the other fellow, what did I just say? Wagner, yes, when he applied millions of years to it. Uh, but he, Antonio Snyder, he did these drawings, um, and he thought that the continent probably broke up during the flood. Now, he didn't have the science back then that we do. He was absolutely right. Uh, that's what we believe nowadays. There's, there's some powerful science behind it. So what we're talking about, imagine there's the Pacific Ocean here and there's Vancouver there and the, and the coastal mountains. We're talking about the Pacific Ocean Plate. It, the, the ocean plates are very heavy. They're composed of different material than the mantle is made of. That, 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 sorry, than the continents are made of. The, the, everything floats on the mantle, but the ocean plates are heavier than the mantle material, which is unstable to begin with. So if you can get those plates... Pull, gravity wants to pull them into the mantle down toward the core. If you can break the friction there, they could go very, very quickly, like in a runaway, catastrophic type of condition. And that's exactly what scientists are finding. Dr. Baumgartner, Dr. John Baumgartner, uh, he uh, developed this model called catastrophic plate tectonics, where the continents move apart very quickly. Now, he was working at this, that was back in the 90s, he's retired now, but he was working at Los Alamos National Laboratories. Um, it's a fairly prestigious scientific outfit if you know your World War II history or if you watched Oppenheimer. Um, using supercomputers, the, the model that he developed it, it is, is very, very complex. All the conservation of energy, all the physics equations go in there to model the movement of the tectonic plates accurately. Now, he is acknowledged as having developed the best 3D supercomputer model of plate tectonics. He is the number one guy in the world, number one geophysicist in the world for modeling how these things move. 
And NASA, his research was partially funded by NASA because they were trying to figure out what's going on on Venus. Venus seems to have been catastrophically resurfaced via rapid plate tectonics. That was the idea back then. So his, his model was partially funded by NASA. His model has been independently duplicated by other researchers and thus verified. If you do an experiment and you keep a good logbook and others can take your notes and they can duplicate what you've done and get the same results, you've done your homework. That's, that's great. And that's what's happened with his model several times now. And by the way, Dr. Baumgartner is a biblical creationist. I just thought I'd throw that in there. So the number one guy in the world, before he retired, in geophysics was Dr. Baumgartner. So what we're talking about is, is something like this, the breakup of the original supercontinent. Of course, this animation isn't realistic because there's no clouds. But, and, and maybe for some other reasons. But <laughs> that, so that's what we're talking about, moving apart like that. Here's one of the outputs from Dr. Baumgartner and his team from their model. This is early in the process. You can see um, uh, the different, or what's going to become North America here. There's South America here, Africa you can see there. The red and yellow areas are high temperature material. And you, so you can see here's the Atlantic, this is going to be the Atlantic Ocean. Out in the Pacific, there's a massive area where hot, essentially molten rock is coming from near the core, forming new ocean floor. So if the Earth is expanding in one location, that means somewhere else it needs to be shrinking. And that's, what hap that's what's happening in the dark blue areas all up and down the west coast here of North and South America, there's a large subduction zone where the Pacific Ocean Plate is being pulled by gravity. It's very heavy, being pulled by gravity into the Earth. What Dr. Baumgartner and his team discovered was that if you can break that friction, like we're still talking about moving solid rock through solid rock. The, the mantle, people think it's just molten rock underneath us. The, the, it's, the mantle's very hot it's, it, at about 80% of its melting temperature, but it's still solid rock. So you have to overcome the friction to get these plates to move with, with any speed. But what his model produced was, if you can get them moving, the friction along the edges will create heat, which melts some of the rock, which almost acts as a lubricant, it's like WD-40 or oil on, 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 on some stuck steel or whatever. And so you get faster movement which creates more friction, which creates more heat, which melts more rock, which add, adds more lubricant. And so it goes faster and faster and faster until all of the pre-flood ocean floor has been pulled into the earth rapidly. Here's a little bit later in the process. You can see things are, are, are moving apart. Uh, there's the Atlantic Ocean opening up here, tens of thousands of kilometers of red hot material coming to the, uh, the surface. What else is going on? You can see India, here's India. And if you can see the, probably can't see it from the back, but there's arrows showing uh, a direction and strength there, speed and that kind of thing. Asia's coming down, India's coming up. Guess what happens when they collide? Smash, you push up the Himalayan mountain chain. Most mountain chains in the world, including the ones that were in here, did not exist before the flood. They're the result of processes going on during the flood. There are fish fossils on the summit of Mount Everest. They're five and a half miles above sea level today. Fish don't climb mountains. How did they get there? That was at one point underneath the oceans. And work has been done on if we go with the standard, the continental drift model that most of us were taught in school of this slow movement, like two inches per year of movement and so on. Is there enough energy there when India smashes up against Asia to push up the Himalayan mountain chain? The answer is no. You need to smash those plates together at a higher rate of speed to get that mountain chain. And so, uh, but that, that, that kind of leads to a question. If Everest is five and a half miles above sea level, well, how, how do you get the water for a global flood? And can you get that much water? Well, you don't need to because before that time, Everest didn't exist, so you don't need that five and a half miles. But how much water could you get? Does anybody know the name Jacques Cousteau, this guy here? You, yeah, some, if you're under 30, you've probably never heard of this guy, but... Cousteau was the, he was not a Christian, not a creationist by any stretch, but he was, uh, he knew a lot about the oceans. He was the first person to take um, like movie cam film cameras in waterproof housings underneath the ocean uh, and, and he did these amazing nature documentaries. He showed the world, he showed all of us the amazing life and, and the structures uh, underneath the ocean. 
It was fascinating stuff. And he was, uh, he was uh, instru instrumental in the development of the aqua lung, which later became scuba. He knew a lot about the oceans. And he said that if you were to raise the ocean bottoms, the oceans are very, very deep in some places, if you were to raise the ocean bottoms and lower the continents so that everything all around the world is at the same level, there's enough water in the oceans right now, Cousteau said, for a global flood of more than two miles. So where did the water come from for the flood? Cousteau inadvertently gave the answer, it came from the oceans. And the Bible tells us that uh, or, 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 well, science and the Bible. The Bible tells us that at the end of the flood, God pushed down the valleys and raised up the mountains and so on. If that's referring to continents and the ocean bottoms, then that's what happened at the end of the flood. And this process of plate tectonics, it's not just a vertical, a lateral movement of the continents. There's also vertical movement. The new hot ocean floor being produced by the, by the, 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 the very hot material, it's less dense it's, it's, it's lighter, so it sits higher, it floats higher on the mantle than the cold, sinking seafloor. The new seafloor, when it was being produced, still warm, would be about a mile higher than the old, sinking ocean floor. So if the ocean floor is suddenly a mile higher, what happens to the water that was in the oceans? Whoosh, out onto land, instant global flood. And so this, this process is, it, it's looking very much like this is what God used to flood the earth. It's amazing. And you have, the, the, again, the breakup of the supercontinent. We looked at large-scale features, the fit of the continents and so on, is an evidence for a global flood. It fits with a global flood. And there's also massive pieces of former ocean floor near the earth's core. This is another real puzzler for the millions of years, folks, that there was measurements made a number of years ago. It's represented by these pictures here of the, the density and the temperature of the rock inside the earth. Now, the gray sphere there in the middle is the core of the earth. The blue areas are low temperature rock. The red areas are high temperature rock. You can see some of the continents outlined in yellow there. There's Hawaii right in the middle of this one. And what puzzled the, the millions of years, folks, is how come there's still so much low temperature rock down near the core? Those are the ocean plates that have been slowly subducting for millions of years. They should already have heated up to the temperature down around the core. And our scientists looked at that and said, ah, it's because they haven't been down there for millions of years. They haven't had the time to heat up that massive volume of rock to the temperature, to the ambient temperatures down near the core. And so there's another evidence that this happened recently associated with a global flood. That's a large scale geologic feature. That's one we can't see without specialized equipment, but those are still large-scale features. So, yes, we see sedimentary rocks showing evidence of rapid deposition. We see large-scale features. Let's move on. In paleontology, we'd expect evidence for both rapid and recent burial. Maybe even evidence that animals and plants were buried alive. Do we see that? Well, we looked at some fossils already in previous sessions. Here's a fossil that was buried quickly. There's a fish fossilized in the process of, process of having its lunch. How long did it take a lunch break for? You know, and it's so, it's so well preserved. That its fins are starting to decompose there a little bit, but its bones are still all together. Again, it's an articulated fossil, not a disarticulated fossil. It hadn't reached that stage of decomposition before it was buried and, and frozen in, in that position. Now, at least the fossil, at least the fish has cartilage. It has bones, essentially. What about things like this? The fossil octopus and fossil jellyfish, those animals don't even have, well, the octopus has like a beak-like structure, but they're mostly soft and squishy material. Jellyfish and an octopus. Could those things have died and then slowly sank to the bottom and slowly be buried over tens or hundreds or thousands of years? Forget it. That's, that's scientific nonsense. Those were... Like, like a jellyfish laying around on a beach. How long do you think that thing could last? Like a week? Maybe? Maybe a week? Rapid burial. Beautiful preservation of even soft tissue. And there are some leaves of trees that have been fossilized. And you can see the vein structure on the leaf. Like in rapid burial. It didn't rot, and, and those details disappear through decomposition. Incredible stuff. So yes, do we have rapidly buried things? Yes, those are examples of rapid burial. What about recent burial? 
things that, things that have not been buried for millions of years. We can turn for this to Dr. Phil Curry. Dr. Curry works at the University of Alberta. He's one of the world's premier dinosaur hunters. We quoted from him already in the dinosaur session, but he, um, in, in his dinosaur book, he said this, bones do not have to be turned to stone to be fossils, and usually most of the original bone is still present in a dinosaur fossil. Is that shocking to you? The bone, the, the dinosaur bone is still there. He, he is a, a world-renowned dinosaur hunter. He knows dinosaur bones. And he's saying that in most cases, the bone is still there. It's been, there have been minerals that have filled up the hollow spaces. It's been permineralized. It's one form of fossilization. But the bone is still there. And it's supposedly more than 65 million years old? I mean, fleshy bits will erode faster than bone, but bones will still decompose. Even bones aren't going to last 65 million years, and yet the original bone's still there. It means they, have, they were buried more recently than that. It's evidence for, recently, for something that's recently buried. Here's another evidence. This is a, a T-Rex named Wankel Rex after Kathy Wankel who discovered it. It's about a 90% complete Tyrannosaurus Rex. Very rare finding something like this. Dr. Mary Schweitzer, another famous uh, paleontologist, she describes it this way. This is an exceptionally well-preserved specimen of the Tyrannosaurus dinosaur, Tyrannosaurus Rex. Shows little evidence of permineralization or fossilization or other diagenetic effects. Most fossils show signs of sediment infilling or secondary material deposition, but certain specimens, like Wankel Rex she's talking about here, can show little evidence of diagenetic change. All right, what does diagenetic mean? I had to look it up too. Uh, diagenesis is the sum of the physical, chemical, and biological changes that take place in sediments as they become consolidated into rocks. What she's saying is there's little of these changes that have taken place around Wankel Rex. There hasn't been enough time. Recent burial. This T-Rex was buried recently. Back to Dr. Curry talking about Wankel Rex. The nodules, iron nodules, uh, prevented water from invading the bones. And I, I love this next sentence, or the, this next part, which for all intents and purposes cannot be distinguished from modern bone. Hold on. So these dinosaur bones of this T-Rex, this Wankel Rex, can't be distinguished from modern bone. So if you, if you get a modern bone of maybe one of your cows that died five years ago or something, and this bone of this T-Rex, they can't, the T-Rex bones can't be distinguished from modern bones, which means the T-Rex bones must be modern bones, <laughs> right? Amazing, and yet he believes in millions of years. He believes, no, no, Wankel Rex died more than 65 million years ago. And yet, the things that he sees, the science that he does, so conflicts with his belief about history. It, it, it's a, it's a mad, you know, I pray that God would open his eyes, and some of the stuff that he writes in some of his books, he would just, just kind of like have that V8 moment. Why didn't I see this? If I'm saying these T-Rex bones look like modern bones, well, that means the T-Rex bones are modern bones. Really? Hello? But it can't see it. No, modern, what do you mean by modern? So some, some animal that's alive today that didn't die millions of years ago. Um, you know, he's comparing it to something uh, he mentioned in the, uh, it's the same book, actually. He mentioned the dinosaur bones laying around in, on the north slope of Alaska there. He says, he calls those modern bones. But those are actual dinosaur bones that he calls modern bones. Here he, here he takes it a step further. He says, this T-Rex bone looks like a modern bone. Yeah, what exactly he means by modern, I'm not sure. But some, likely, he means some animal that died recently, right? Like he, he, was, he was saying people thought that they were bison bones. Well, the bison died out a number of years ago, but uh, uh, still not millions of years. So he's comparing these bones that he believes are millions of years old. He fully believes it to animals that died maybe in the last couple hundred years. It's amazing. 
And then, oh, we've, we've done this a couple times already. There's, uh, again, more evidence for recent burial. How long could DNA last? Again, we've done this. But, okay, so we see in paleontology evidence for both rapid and recent burial. There are some examples. There's others we could give. But, again, for time, we'll move on. We'd also expect to find a general pattern in the fossil record with exceptions. The, the, the flood, especially moving water, has a tremendous ability to sort things by size, by shape, and by buoyancy. So what would a global flood do? The first things to be buried, we would think, if the water starts getting more violent on a global scale, would be things at the bottom of the ocean, and then fish, and then amphibians near the shore, and then reptiles that live also near the shore. And the last things to be buried, we would think, would be things living in the middle of the continents, like mountain goats, right? And we... With scientists do see that general pattern in the fossil record, but there's also exceptions to that pattern. And we can actually just do a little rabbit trail here. If you, just, if you, if you know about the composition of the fossil record, it points, in a, it points very strongly in one direction. Did you know that 95% of all the fossils in the entire world are marine organisms? 95%. Almost the entire fossil record is marine organisms. Well, how about a marine catastrophe caused the fossil record of primarily marine organisms? Hey, that's a good fit. Now, what about the other 5%? Well, just, just for completeness, let's have a look at the remaining 5%. 95% of that 5% is algae and plant fossils. That includes the trees and trillions of tons of coal and all the other invertebrate fossils, uh, including the insects. 5% of 5% or a quarter percent of the entire fossil record is vertebrates. That's all fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, mammals, and dinosaurs. Now, of the vertebrates, of that quarter percent, 1% or 0 0.0025 are vertebrate fossils that consist of more than a single bone. So that, that kind of indicates how rare it is to find a 90% complete T. rex skeleton, like Wankel Rex, like we just saw there. So as far as all the fossils go, it's most, it's clams from bottom to top. That's the fossil record. It's a marine catastrophe is a good explanation. But anyways, let's get back on track here. So moving water can sort things by size, by shape, and by buoyancy. And that even happens to some extent in air. It, it's, it's more pronounced in water, but you can take, for example, a, a, a mixture of different grains of sand and silt and so on, different grain sizes, and mix them all up together and then drop them into a flask and they will settle themselves out into fine, coarse, fine, coarse, fine, coarse. And, and scientists have done that. You can, you can do that experiment yourself. You can see it in various places on the beach or whatever. If you did, but, did, dig a sand castle or whatever, you can see layers often in the sand where the waves have come up and they've, they've shuffled the various grains of sand that are on the beach there and made these little layers. We saw that at Mount St. Helens on a, on a little bigger scale. The mud flow that came from the top of the mountain, actually that was a pyroclastic flow in that middle section there laid down on June 19th in about three hours. That was steam and gas and dust and, and, and all kinds of stuff coming down there. And it settled, it sorted itself out into fine coarse, fine coarse, little layers like that. And then on, on going up scale again, we see that in Grand Canyon. Now here we have very like large layers that within them, there, there's sub-layers within them. And so we might imagine that, that one day current comes from this particular direction. It brings in a type of limestone and that gets deposited, fine course, fine course. Then, then a, a week later or something, the, the direction changes. It brings in a sandstone from a different area where it was eroded and we have another layer forming. Fine course, fine course within that layer. We can imagine those things happening during the flood, not over millions of years. Now, it was a catastrophic event, so we should observe exceptions to that general pattern. And this is where the biblical model deviates greatly with evolution. Evolution predicts a very ordered pattern, no exceptions. Because they, they say, for example, in this layer we have these animals, and in this layer these guys evolved into these guys, or they went extinct. So in this layer, you're never ever going to see again the guys in this layer. They have to have a very ordered sequence of the fossil record. The problem is, that's not what scientists find. There are all kinds of, they're called out-of-place fossils, or out-of-place artifacts. Here's an example. 
That cliff face you're seeing on the horizon there, that's the Horema Formation in South America. It's dated in the, in the standard dating, the evolutionary dating, to be 550 million years old. There's a closer view of it. Now, it's very rich in fossil pollen. Fossil pollen, a lot of fossil pollen in that formation. Here's the problem. Flowering plants, the plants that make pollen, were not supposed to have evolved for another 390 million years. So how can you have pollen 390 million years before the plants that make it? That is a massive out-of-place fossil. It's, it's, it's crazy. But, and there's many examples of that, but that doesn't stop evolutionists from putting things like this in our kids' textbooks. You have this, look, look how neat this is. All these fossils from supposedly simple to complex, and they're all tied to a particular time period and they name them all and so on and, and it looks very neat and organized and th this is how the fossil record is established and we're told that at one point it was the age of dinosaurs and it was dinosaurs and there may have been some little mammals running around but it was the age of dinosaurs very neat and categorized then the dinosaurs went extinct and then it was the age of mammals and, and that kind of thing the thing is that's not what scientists see in the real world it's in our textbooks but it doesn't happen in the real world. Dr. Carl Werner has gone around to many, the curators of, of museums all around the world um, with his wife Debbie. They, they traveled over 160,000 kilometers, taken 60,000 photographs for their TV series. And he's interviewed curators of museums. What are, you, what are the scientists actually finding in the dinosaur layers? And here's one of the quotes from his book. Paleontologists, he says, have found over 432 mammal species, not just individual mammals, but whole mammal species in the dinosaur layers. That's almost as many as the number of dinosaur species. But where are these fossils, he asks. We visited 60 museums but did not see a single complete mammal skeleton from the dinosaur layers displayed at any of these museums. This is amazing, he says. So the scientists at the museums and the curators of the museums that he's interviewed, they all know that there are just about as many mammals in the so-called age of dinosaurs as there are dinosaurs. But when you take your kids and grandkids through these museums, that's not what's on display. They're, they're pushing this notion of, well, it was the age of dinosaurs. It wasn't the age of mammals. And so in the displays, you see dinosaurs and all the amazing plants that lived supposedly at the time of the dinosaurs, but you don't find the mammals. But if you turn to the scientists, they're finding mammals in the dinosaur rocks. There's a snow job going on there. You go to museums and, you, you, and we hope that they're displaying things accurately. But in this case, they're not. Here's another problem. Living fossils. That might be a bit, of a bit of a weird term. Aren't fossils dead things, right? What are, what are living fossils? Living fossils are things that don't evolve. Uh, little, little problem for evolution there. For example, I've got a number of examples here. Ginkgo trees, those are trees that are alive today and they're also in the fossil record. They're dated to be 125 million years old by the evolutionists, that's not our dating. Here's the problem. Here's what makes it a living fossil. The, the, the fossil leaves and branches that have been found are identical to the living counterparts, which means there's been no evolution for 125 million years? There have been, there's been massive climate change since that time. Even the radiation from the sun has changed massively in that huge period of time. There should have been change if that time scale is true, but there isn't. Ginkgo trees are living fossils. That's what they call them when they, when they have no other explanation. Crocodiles, 140 million years. They look identical to their fossil counterparts. The Tuatara lizard still lives today. Its fossils are 200 million years old. They look identical. Horseshoe crabs, 200 million years. The lingula lampshell, 450 million years. No evolution. The Neophilina mollusks, 500, half a billion years. No evolution. Crazy. Living fossils are a huge problem for evolution. Why? Because evolutionary history doesn't include a global flood. The flood is the key to making sense about some of this stuff. This picture in textbooks, it doesn't exist anywhere in the world. There's little fragments that you can, you can kind of match here and there, but the whole thing doesn't exist anywhere. Our guys, Bible-believing scientists, have drawn up other, throw this out and draw up other ones. Here's another one here. 
that might be much more helpful in understanding the rock record and time scale and so on. There are two scales here. Here's a time scale here and a rock scale here. So if we start down here at creation, around 4000 BC, creation was a short period of time and it produced a huge amount of rock. This would have been the rock that God created on day three. God created the land on day three. And then you have the pre-flood era, about 1700 years or so, not much going on geologically. It's a fairly large time period, but not a lot going on. There would have been river erosion and things like that, but not, not a whole lot going on. Then you have the flood, which was a short time period, but it produced a huge amount of rock. It would have ripped up a lot of the originally created rock and redistributed and resorted and redeposited it elsewhere. And Dr. Taz Walk, Tasman Walker did this from our Australian office. He's our, one of our geologists. He's got the, the flood broken up into different phases here. You can see the eruptive phase, the initial 40 days that the Bible mentions very, very prominently when the water, the, 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 the windows of heaven open, the, the fountains of the great deep open up. Then the waters continue ascending 50 days after that. They continue ascending 60 days after that until they reach their zenith, or their highest amount. Then the water, the Bible tells us, begins to, the, the water begins to abate and eventually it disperses from the continents. Now, this scale, th there will be different geologic features produced in each one of those phases of the flood. And so if we have this in our minds or if geologists have this in their minds, we can go and look at, okay, well, that, that was probably mid-flood there. And then, yeah, it was eroded. So that would have been, it would have been eroded during the dispersal time of the flood. And they can kind of work that out. Much, much more helpful than this, you know, the, the, the one that appears in textbooks. And other people, have, other creationists have done other drawings. Uh, here's another one here, slightly different ideas behind it. Somebody did one for Grand Canyon. So we have the different, uh, the different layers in Grand Canyon here. And here's creation and pre-flood. So this would have been deposited pre-flood. Then you've got the flood here. And this is broken up into all kinds of different things. And you only get up to mid-flood by the time you get to the rim of the canyon all the late flood deposition has been eroded. And so there, there's a way of thinking biblically about the strata in Grand Canyon. So, do we see a general pattern with exceptions? Yes. Let's, uh, we, we can talk about other things, but uh, let's, let's move on. In ancient history, we'd expect to find evidence that human population in ancient nations began about 4,400 years ago. So let's just start with something simple. How about population growth? Can we get around 8 billion people from the time of the flood? Starting with those that got off the ark? Does that, does that even work out mathematically? Well, the current population growth is 1.1% per year. What that means is for every 100 million people that there are, 1.1 million are added every year. That's a 1.1% growth rate. All it would take to get to our current population is half a percent. So we're in the right ballpark. It's not difficult to get. You don't need half a percent. Our current growth rate is 1.1. No problem getting the current population from the time of the flood. But what about the other history? What if humans have been around for a million years? As some evolutionists say, depending on when, what you call fully human, but if you go with the evolutionary scenario, and let's just let's artificially reduce the growth rate to something really, really small to try to get it to work. If we reduce it to something like 0.01%, even at that incredibly low growth rate, the population would be something like 1 to the 43rd, or, or 10 to the 43rd. That's the number one with 43 zeros after it. Where is everybody? We should be tripping over bones and, and people who've, who've, who've been buried. The evolutionary history is way off. Biblical history, again, it, it, it fits very well. We just, just start our thinking with the Bible and everything works out over and over again. Now, nations originated from Noah's family as well. And this is something that's recorded in history in a way that can never be wiped out. It's amazing. Many of the world's most ancient nations can be traced back to a single family. Now, if there wasn't a global flood, why would you be able to do that? Why, why one family? For example, Mizraim is one of Noah's grandsons. That's the Hebrew word for Egypt. In fact, some translations of our English Bibles, Mizraim is a Hebrew word. And so they just translate it into English and say Egypt. When, when they talk about Mizraim, 
the English translation is Egypt. But that nation goes back directly to Noah's family. Ashkenaz, one of Noah's great grandsons, is the Hebrew word for Germany. Canaan, that's one we're kind of more familiar with maybe, is the Hebrew name for the general region called by the Romans later on, Palestine. Javan is the Hebrew word for Greece. Kash is the Hebrew word for old Ethiopia, ancient Ethiopia. Meshach is the ancient name for Moscow. You still see those names. Meshach, the spelling is unchanged. You still see that name on maps today around, around Moscow. In, in, if you have a study Bible, you have a, might have a map that looks something like this. Many of the ancient nations, that, that, that's where Noah's family spread out to, and those nations came from Noah's family. It's amazing. In addition to all of that, there's over 400 flood legends, flood traditions, in cultures all around the globe. Now, even, even people here at the end of the chart, in, in Fiji and Hawaii, they have a flood legend that's, that's comparable, in many cases, to what's recorded in the Bible. Now, why on earth would the people in Hawaii and Fiji have a flood legend that, that matches in many details what the Bible says? It's, it's because all nations on earth actually do have a flood account in their people's history because all people came from Noah's family. And Noah's family has a flood legend in their, obviously, in their history. That's why every people group, hundreds and hundreds of people groups, have a flood legend in their own people's history. Very, very difficult for the evolutionists and, and, and people who say there never was a global flood to explain that one. How come all these people, like they, in Fiji and Hawaii, that's pretty isolated. Did they, did they get that idea from some other culture somewhere else? That's, that's, that's pushing it, I think, to try to propose something like that. In their own people's history, they have a flood account. Amazing. The Bible in Genesis 10 says this, to Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided. Now this is not referring to what we talked about a few minutes ago, the division of the physical earth. This is talking about a division of the people of the earth by language. A few verses later in Genesis 11 verse 1, it says, now the whole earth had one language. The word earth there also is not referring to the physical earth. The whole earth had one language. The people of the earth had one language. That's the usage there in Genesis 11, same as it is here. Now, according to one Bible historian, the flood was about 2349 to 2348 BC, and Peleg was born about 100 years after that. Now, if that's accurate, let's just look at other historical documents about the founding of some of the world's most ancient nations and see if they formed after Peleg was born. That would, that would corroborate, that would support the Bible's time scale there because if the Tower of Babel happened at the time of Peleg or when he was born and then people started scattering out, we would expect that in the years after that, some of the ancient nations would form. Let's have a look. The founding of Babylon. In 331 BC, after Alexander the Great had defeated Darius, he went to Babylon, and there he received 1,903 years of astronomical observations from the Chaldeans, who were there at that point, which they claimed dated back to the founding of Babylon. Well, that would place the founding of Babylon in 2234 BC, or about 13 years after the birth of Peleg. That's a pretty good fit. Isn't it? Babylon, Babel, very close. What of the founding of Egypt, another ancient nation? The Byzantine historian Constantinus Manassas, he wrote that the Egyptian state lasted for 1,663 years. Okay, now if that's accurate, all we need to do is count backwards from when Egypt was conquered in 526, and we get a founding of Egypt in 2188 BC, about 60 years after the birth of Peleg. So there's another historical document that agrees with scripture. It matches with the time scale that we have there in scripture. The founding of Greece. According to the fourth century bishop and historian Eusebius of Caesarea, is a fairly famous, uh, you might recognize that name in church history. Um, he said that the first king of the Greek city of Sicyon, which is west of Corinth, began his reign 1,313 years before the first Olympics. L Olympics came from Greece. Well, the first Olympics was in 77, uh, 776 BC, so that would give us a founding of Greece in 2089 BC, about 160 years after the birth of Peleg. Again, that's a really good fit. 
So there are other historical records that match, that confirm and support the biblical account of a global flood and then about 100 years later, the people being dispersed from Babel and then the nations beginning to form after that point. It's amazing. And of course, with the origin of nations in Babel, uh, of course, we think about the origin of languages, right? Now, the evolutionists also have a view of language that's similar to their view of biology. It's, it's, kinda, it's back to the tree diagram, right? Like all languages came from an original proto-language that was, you know, whatever, grunts and ha 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 you club your wife over the head and drag her back to your cave and that kind of thing. And then, and then the idea is that language came from there. The problem is that's not what linguists find. People who, who study language and the origin of language and so on. You can group languages together in certain groups like French and, and Spanish and German and so on. Uh, that's one language group. There's similarities if you're bilingual. Uh, there's similarities between those languages. There's about 20 or so-ish uh, family languages or, or yeah, yeah, groups of languages, uh, language families, and there's very little connection between those, those 20 or so language families. Yes, you can group a number of languages together, but, but then you can't go any further. So this evolutionary notion of a proto-language leading to all languages doesn't seem to be supported by what the experts are telling us, the experts in linguistics. This seems to be supported that God supernaturally created maybe 20 or so language families in the families that moved away from Babel. Babel was only about 100 years after the flood. Not a huge amount of time there. There weren't millions of people. It was probably just family groups moving away from Babel and God gave them a language, they gave these a language and they gave this other family a language and then they formed the ancient nations. Now, one people group in particular is often held up against a global flood. The skeptics will say, you know what? Your flood account in your Bible isn't true because the Chinese people have an unbroken history going right back through your little global flood here and therefore the Bible's wrong about there being a global flood. Okay, well let's have a look at the Chinese language. You might, you might know that their, their uh, writing is a little, more, a little more fancy than our alphabet and some of their words, like the word here is covet or desire, it's composed of other words. For example, covet or desire is composed of the word for two trees. You can see it up top there. You add that to the word woman and you get the word covet or desire. Why? Two trees, woman gives you covet or desire? Why, why, why would that be? Oh, maybe it's because, oh, she, she desired the fruit that was on one of those two trees. Okay. So the events of creation are embedded into the ancient Chinese script. The, the modern Chinese script has deviated from this a little bit. There's still a connection between them, but a lot of these characters are found on ancient, uh, ancient pottery and so on from many years ago. Here's a word that means forbidden or to warn. Again, you see the word for two trees, as, as in the previous example. You add that to the word God, and you get the word forbidden. Why? You put the word two trees and God together and that means forbidden? Why would that be? Oh, oh, maybe it's because God forbade them from eating from one of those two trees. Here's a word for boat. It's composed of the word vessel. That one kind of makes sense, right? So that boat is a vessel. Eight people. The Chinese script was developed after these events took place. The events of Genesis and a global flood are embedded in the original Chinese language. The Chinese nation and language began after the flood, not before. Amazing. Genesis tells us that eight people survived on a large boat. Uh, the Chinese language, again, was developed after these events took place. So we've gone through these various uh, these, these three subjects here, we can, we can add a, a number of other consequences for Noah's flood. An ice age, that was one of the questions that was raised already. We talked about an ice age. You need warm oceans, more evaporation, and cooler summers. The flood is a perfect trigger for getting an ice age going. Again, beginning right after the flood, lasting about 700 years. So you've got warm oceans after the flood as a result of all the activity, the friction, the massive hot rock coming up dur during the flood, 
warm oceans after the flood producing a lot of evaporation. You get the, the, the dust and pollutants from the continents, from, from the uh, volcanoes, making the continents cooler, reflecting some of that sunlight back into space, way up at the top there. And, uh, and because of the, you, you get snowfall and cooler summers, perfect conditions for an ice age. So an ice age would have lowered ocean levels, causing all of the continents to be connected by land, by dry land. That's another, because one of the questions that, that we have as Christians is, okay, well, if the ark lands in the Middle East after the flood, so now the continents are all in their current locations, which means Australia is over there off by itself, and presumably kangaroos get off the ark in the Middle East. Well, kangaroos don't swim. How do they get to Australia? But in the Ice Age, here's a picture showing the maximum extent of the, the glaciation. You can see pretty much all of Canada was covered. It goes down some distance into the States. And over in, in, uh, in Europe there in Moscow, you see there as well. And there was a bit of, in, in, there was some glaciation in the southern tips of uh, South America and also Tasmania, just uh, south of um, Australia there. But mostly here, mostly in the northern hemisphere. Now, you're storing huge amounts of seawater on land in these ice sheets. Both creationists and evolutionists believe the oceans would have been probably more than 200 feet lower than they are today. So way lower than they are today, which would lead to land bridges. So as the population of kangaroos grows, where the ark lands, it grows and grows and grows. They eventually get to Australia. And then, so how did they get there? They just hopped. No need to swim. And at the end of the Ice Age, the glaciers melt, the ocean water begins to come back up, and now Australia is an island. And it's been suggested, some, some biologists have suggested, that the only reason that kangaroos haven't gone extinct in Australia yet, they've gone extinct, they, they used to live everywhere else, lots of evidence that can, kangaroos lived everywhere, but the reason they haven't gone extinct in Australia is because even today they have no natural predator. Everywhere else in the world there's you know, lions and tigers and bears, oh my, and, uh, and, and they, they may have wiped out the kangaroos, but today, they're even, even today, there's no natural predator in Australia. And maybe that's the only reason we, uh, we see them in Australia today. So interesting, thinking about there, there's a flood and there's consequences of the flood that help us to answer even more questions from the Bible. Uh, amazing. What can we conclude then? If the flood is responsible for the fossil record, then the millions of years explanation is wrong, right? It can't be both. Either the flood laid down the layers that we see all around the world, or it did not. If the flood didn't, then you need millions of years. But I'd like to suggest the flood did it. But if the flood did it, then scientists can't go and point to the fossils in there and point to the rocks and try to radiometric date the rocks and so on and say they're millions of years old. They're not. This was laid down in the flood. Right? That, that really impacts our understanding of, of what we're being told and so on. And It's a very different way. It's a biblical way of looking at the Earth's geology. If you get the flood right, you'll get the age of the Earth right. So many people struggle with the age of the Earth. The flood is the key to understanding the age of the earth. I said this already in the first session. A flood would have aged the earth, if you want to think of it that way. It accelerated plate tectonics. It accelerated mountain building. It accelerated deposition of sediments. It accelerated erosion, partially, of those sediments. It accelerated all those features. Like we, we look at, for example, or scientists look at the Appalachian Mountains in, in, in the, in the, on, along the east coast, well, in, inward from the east, in the east of the U.S., and they look at the Rockies, and the Rockies are pointed and jagged. And they say, well, the Rockies are younger than the Appalachian Mountains because the Appalachian Mountains are rounded. How do they know these are younger than these? These are more eroded than these. They may not be, the, they may not be very different in age at all. What we can see is that the Rockies are less eroded and the Appalachians are more eroded. From, from a flood perspective, we would, we would say, well, they were both produced in the flood. The, as a result of the, the compression, you have plates that are folding and buckling and so on, and the Pacific plate coming in, it would have, I think it's like the peanut butter effect. Um, you know, you, you, have, you have the last little bit of peanut butter and you get a spatula and you go around the edge of the peanut butter jar. That's kind of like the Pacific plate subducting underneath this part of the continent. It's below us right now. 
and it, the continent is scraping off all the peanut butter, all the stuff that, that accumulated on the ocean floor, and it's piling up at the edge of the continents. So that, that produced the mountain ranges. And it's also buckling the edge of the continents, being compressed as that ocean plate comes against it. So you've got sediment building up there. If you fly over the Rockies, I'll, I'll do that on Monday. I'll fly, back, I'll fly to Vancouver first from PG and then back, back to Toronto. And then I get, I have a, we have the CMI vehicle there and then I'll drive an hour to Kitchener. And uh, you fly over the Rockies and it's, it's sedimentary rock, but it's not horizontal, is it? It's this way and that way and this way and there's, there's folding and there's bending and there's cracking and so on. So that was, it was laid down during the flood and then that compression just moved it all around. And so we can, you see how we can understand these things from a biblical perspective without the need to apply millions of years at all. It's, it, but it produces a very different way of thinking. Data from ancient history, geology, paleontology, and many other fields, those are the three we covered, many other fields support the historical reality of a global flood as the Bible describes. And the, the, the final conclusion is, you can trust the Bible. Just trust the Bible. You don't have to take the long way around. Well, I'll, 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 you know, I'm gonna follow science and see where it leads. If you, it's gonna lead to the Bible. <laughs> Just start your thinking from the Bible and it'll make so much more sense because the Bible's history is true. God did create, there was a global flood, then there was the Tower of Babel, et cetera, et cetera, then Jesus died to pay for sinners. Um, have a look at creation.com for more information. Uh, my TV show, you can have a look at that. Uh, we're on YouTube and Rumble and everywhere else. There's over 180 episodes online now at creation.com. Creation Magazine, I've mentioned that a number of times already. Uh, it, it teaches how science matches scripture in article after article. Again, m one of my number one recommendations there. It's a quarterly magazine. You get four a year, not 12. I mean, we're all busy, right? We, we want you to actually read the magazines. That's why it's, we, people have told us, I, lo I love this magazine, why don't you do it monthly? It's like, we really don't think it would, be re it, would, it would be read as much. That's why there's three months between each one. And I understand you creation magazine junkies, you know, I want more. <laughs> but it, it's, we think that's the best way to go. Um, and again, my number, number one equipping tool there. What else do we have on Noah's flood? Um, the answers book, there's this book here, Noah's Ark, a feasibility study. This guy, Dr. John Wood Morapi, he, uh, well, he, ha he has Tretz. You know what that is? It's a nervous disorder. He's, he's often shaking a little bit. He has a, is a rubber band that he spins in his fingers to help him calm down. But he has insomnia. He doesn't sleep. He just does research all the time. The guy's a machine. He's incredible. And he's, he's done this book looking at every argument the skeptics have thrown at the story of Noah and the flood and the ark and so on. It, you know, how did eight people take care of that many animals? What about the food supply? What about the waste? What about heating? What about water supply, fresh water over a year? What, what about the smell? You know, every, everything he's looked at. And the, the bibliography is about a quarter of the entire thickness of the book. Like his references are about a quarter of the, of the book pages. It's incredible. Actually, do, do you know what kind of lights they had on board the ark? Floodlights. Sorry. <laughs> Actually, there's this one here. I don't have a slide of this one. Um, How Noah's Flood Shaped the Earth. It's another, another great book. I don't have a slide here, but another great book on the ark. But yeah, if you're, if you're wanting to, to kind of look at what the skeptics typically throw at the ark and how to refute them. There's a great book there. Here's another great book here. Biblical Geology 101. I've mentioned this one already. Another, another great book to help you see the world through that lens of scripture, the history that's there in the Bible. The Mount St. Helens DVD, I think I mentioned that one already. Some amazing things happen at Mount St. Helens that really help us, like in the real world, not theory, it's in the real world that help us understand what may have been going on on a much bigger scale in a global flood. So amazing things happen around, at, around Mount St. Helens. Obviously, the Genesis account is going to take you through those flood chapters. If you've gotten that one, uh, our kids' books, there's often flood information put in there. The, the, the massive pack is going to have that. And again, that's heavily, heavily discounted. So if you're thinking of getting you know, this one and this one and this one and this one separately, well, like add it up in your head and then and see, if, see if it's cheaper to get the big pack. Uh, it, that might be because it's massively discounted. 
Noah's flood is the key to understanding earth history. Does that statement make more sense now than when we started? It really does, doesn't it? Without a global flood, we would be off the trail in many areas. And so, yeah, it really does, to help, it does help understand Noah's flood and how that, uh, how that impacts ancient history and paleontology and geology, the world around us. So, ah, this has been fun. So we've got, what time is it? We've got half an hour until our closing time at 4.30. So here are, these are typical questions that people have. For those of you who want to stick around, if you have things to do, please feel free to get up and, and, and make your way out. Or if you, or if you want to get some resources on the way out, that's fine. But for those of you, if, if, if we, we'll, we'll go to our scheduled end time here at 4.30. And uh, if you want to ask them questions, we can do that now. Um, but don't feel like you have to stay. You've been here already all day and, and it's, it's after lunch. I've seen some drooping eyelids here. After, but hey, no judgment. <laughs> but uh, the, these are typical questions that people have. If you see something up there that you've always wondered about, you can just shout out the number. They're all numbered there. You don't have to ask questions off the screen. If, if something in Genesis has always bugged you, then by all means ask that. 